introduce myself first, and then we'll get started. Um, for those of you here in the room, we probably have, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of people online watching this as a live Google Plus Hangout. So I'll simply state that um, unlike some BCG meetings, we're not going to state client names and, and so on and so forth in this setting. For those of you online, thank you for joining as well. We have probably three or 400 of BCG's greatest strategists here in the room in Paris. And we're, uh, we're thinking uh, today and tomorrow about the future of strategy today and tomorrow. And um, it's a great pleasure for me, actually, to be sharing the first in a series of Google Plus Hangouts and also a live meeting on tips for practical creativity, how to be creative, hashtag how to be creative, that is. So um, the way we've structured this is not using traditional BCG slides. So this is the last one that you'll see. For those of you looking at it online, um, it may or may not be a mirror image. I don't know. But if it is, that's an interesting element of creativity, to look at things in the mirror like Leonardo da Vinci always used to do. So um, that's an extra challenge for you, but it's big font. So don't worry. Um, so introduction first. My name is Alan Eaney. I've been with BCG for 12 years. And for the last five or six, I've had the rather unique pleasure of a job focused entirely on creativity in the business world. I'm the co-author with my friend Luc de Brabander, more on him in a moment, of a book called Thinking in New Boxes, which we'll come to again in a second. Uh, but basically, I get to speak with clients all around the world, all across industries, from industrial cables to luxury hotels and soft drinks to whatever else you could imagine about how we can think, how we can stretch our perspectives and look at things differently. And in the years that I've been doing that, I was actually just counting this morning, and I've been working in 18 countries this year alone so far. So it's really a very global thing. But what I wanted to do is gather a sort of top 10 tips for how to be creative, as I said, with a hashtag in front, um, in order to really allow you to bring these ideas to your clients or online to bring these ideas to your day-to-day -day work. Um, and so I'm going to present it in a very visual way, and we will have time for Q&A both from the room, and Rachel here is going to help facilitate if there's Q&A from the thousands of people online who are watching. So here we go. Uh, number 10 on this top 10 list. And this is probably the most important thing that I ever learned from Luke, my co-author. Um, if you want to think creatively, you have to start by understanding how we think. And this is the main premise of the book, of thinking in new boxes. Of the, It's now in nine languages, and there's a 10th one coming in the next few weeks. But the gist of it is very, very simple. And I'm able now to give you the sort of one minute version of the first couple of chapters of the book, um, unless there's any objections from my mentor at the back. Um, so the gist of it is as follows. How we think, how we can think creatively. Look at the world in front of us, in all of its glory and complexity and ambiguity and uncertainty, all of which is only increasing, as has been quantitatively proven by others. Um, and imagine that we take that world and deliberately oversimplify into mental models, or what we call boxes. And then we use those boxes to actually face the world in front of us. And to actually understand that is already a fantastic beginning to thinking creatively. You know, if you can imagine all of the clients that I see, really, if I ask them, have you tried to be creative? Have you had a brainstorm, an ideation workshop, any of these things in the last six months? Yes, of course, everybody raises their hands. And then if I say, are you unreservedly delighted with the output of this brainstorm and ideation workshop? All the hands go down. Why? Because people have this attitude of all we have to do is bring smart people together in a room with flip charts and snacks and say, all right, off we go. Think outside the box. Let's be creative. And yet, if we actually find the time to understand what are some of our existing boxes, this is who we are. This is how we think about our customers. This is how we think about our competition. To actually understand that we think using these simplified boxes and then the process of thinking really is not only using them, this is the deductive, logical, analytical thought that takes up 90% of our business day, but actually creating new ones, the more inductive form of thought. How can we find useful new ones? And so the first tip I'll share, number 10 on the top 10 list, is to begin by understanding how we think, to get a better understanding of the deductive process of using our existing mental models and the inductive process of coming up with new ones. Now, 
what I've been getting at is essentially thinking outside the box then is really not sufficient. Because if we accept the fact that we're human and we use boxes to think, then getting outside the box is a little bit meaningless. Instead, it's a question of understanding which are the ones we're currently using and which ones of those are really set in stone that we should keep and which should we challenge. And I give you an example from the low-cost airline space. You know, today when I say low-cost airlines, you think of Indigo or Jetstar or Southwest or Ryanair or something like that, depending where in the world you're coming from. Of course, 50, 60 years ago, before Southwest and then Ryanair pioneered this new business model, um, there was no such thing as this low-cost airline. And you had all of these uh, regular carriers with the previous incarnations of their logos um, simply going about business as usual. And so what did it really take to set up the first low-cost airline? Quite simply, the identification and challenging of some of the assumptions inherent in the minds of all of these traditional airline executives. So for example, we need many types of planes to serve different destinations and markets. No, we're going to have one type of plane. We use travel agents. We're not going to use travel agents. We have assigned seating. We're going to have open seating. We use hub and spoke. We're going to do point to point system. We have all inclusive pricing. We're going to have unbundled pricing instead. We consider safety our number one top priority. We can keep that one. You see what I mean? And so it's a question of understanding which of them are really set in stone. Because by the way, this question of using travel agents was pretty much set in stone as well in the minds of all of these executives. But to actually understand which might be ready for a change. This is how we think about the world. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way we think about our competition. All of these things, if you are willing to identify and challenge one or more of your existing boxes, the results can be just as powerful as coming up with some brand new invention. With me so far, let's move on to number eight. Um, have a very specific question or challenge in mind and then make it very visual and evocative. And here, keeping this attitude of the travel industry in mind, which is really inherent to so much of the lives of many, many people in this room who've uh, flown to Paris, but also all over the place in the last few weeks. Um, a quick story about a small, medium-sized airport. Um, you can see maybe behind this thing, the baggage claim. And it's, it's a fantastic story that I read about a couple of months ago where um, this airport had huge numbers of customer complaints about how long it took, it took the bags to arrive at baggage claim. Now, of course, um, that's not really an issue for most of the consultants in the room who hate checking a bag and almost never will do so, um, except when they're traveling with their families, of course. Um, but customer complaints were through the roof at this airport. And it was they, they did the analysis, they did the operations, they looked at this and they said, okay, it's taking 13 minutes on average for the bags to arrive. And at other airports of our size, it's taking nine to 10 minutes. So this is a problem. They looked at the process flow, they hired extra baggage handlers, they did all of the sort of ops type things. And over the course of six, nine months, they brought the average time down to eight, nine minutes. So 30% improvement, fantastic. And yet, customer complaints did not budge. They were still just as high as before. So they still had a fundamental problem here. And maybe they could go through another round of operational improvements and improve by one more minute or so. But they were already now top quartile. So really, um, the question of how many more baggage handlers could you hire and how much more could you improve the process was you know. So I don't know if those in the room have additional suggestions for what they might do at this stage. Um, if you don't know the story. Any ideas? Outliers. Look at outliers, right? Look at which, which ones were taking 20 minutes and why, and which ones were taking five minutes and why. Good, what else? Ah, you're a cynic. So make it take longer, <laughs> like at uh, like at Charles de Gaulle, uh, where you absolutely have to sort of go around this thing and down and then back out again. Yes. So um, there are other answers possible as well. Like, for example, have uh, entertainment or duty free shopping or free Wi-Fi at the baggage claim or things like this, or even uh, have a juggler standing there. I don't care. Whatever you want to help people pass the time better. Um, and in the end, what it takes to think in that way is instead of thinking, how can I minimize the number of minutes for the bags to arrive, you have to think, how can I minimize customer complaints? Because if you look at it that way, it's a completely different thing. 
they did actually look at the number of minutes and how it was spreading. And in the end, they found that at other airports of their size, um, people would have to walk about five minutes and thus wait four or five minutes for the bags. Whereas at their airport, people only had to walk two, three minutes because it was very efficient. So they were waiting seven, eight minutes for the bags. And this was the problem. So instead of actually having free Wi-Fi or, or entertainment or some such thing, they actually did, as you suggested, believe it or not, and they deliberately made the process less convenient and efficient for the passengers by adding walls and using further away gates and further away baggage claims, making the walk longer, and the complaints dropped almost to zero. So it's fantastic. Absolutely great. They solved the problem. But the point is, we have to not only come with a specific question when we're trying to be creative. In other words, how can we grow? How can we cut costs is not enough. We have to be as specific as we can. And then think about how can we reformulate it in a very visual way? How can we look at the question in different ways? How can we, instead of saying, how can we grow given uh, mega trends like rise of India and sustainability and urbanization and aging population, suddenly say to yourself, what would a family picnic in Bangalore look like five years from now? And suddenly, you've covered all of those trends, but in a much more visual and evocative way. And so the point number eight here is being very, very careful and thoughtful and deliberate about the question you're asking when you brainstorm, rather than, again, simply hopping into a room and saying, off we go, think outside the box. Now, number seven. Challenge your inputs as they can be seen in many different ways. We as consultants have a habit of making 200 page slide decks full of stuff, full of facts, full of trends and customer research and competitive intelligence and IP analysis and all of the stuff you want. And all of this, please don't get me wrong, is important and necessary and useful, but it's not sufficient. Because in the end, no matter how fantastic the algorithms and the big data and all the rest are that we have, it's still going to be on us as human beings to look at these things in fresh ways, to interpret these things in fresh ways. You could have different companies with precisely the same 100-page slide deck of trends who don't come up with the same strategy. Because in the end, it's how you look at them. And being willing to challenge how you look at the world in front of you how you interpret it, the hypotheses and boxes that you use to look at this information, that's where we, as intelligent human beings, really can add value when we're trying to be creative. And a very quick example here from the, the bookshop industry, which, as you can imagine, uh, has been under massive pressure in the last couple of decades, maybe a little bit less in France than in the US and in other places, uh, because people really have an affinity here for going to bookstores. Um, so Amazon is not quite as dominant here as it is in the US and Germany and many other places. Um, but still, imagine. 20 years ago in the US, just as one example, where the two biggest chains were Barnes & Noble and Borders. They were both faced with precisely the same facts, namely the rise of Amazon in terms of selling books and the rise of the iPod in terms of digital music and so on. So what did they do? They actually landed in fundamentally different places. Borders decided to devote more of the floor space in its stores to music to CDs because they said, look, this is real quality music. You can actually have better dynamic range than digital and, and so on and so forth. So they focused on that and they outsourced their online sales to Amazon with the logic. It may sound stupid now, but the logic was, of course, um, this is their core competency. It's not ours. We don't know about this newfangled internet thing. Um, and so they outsourced it to Amazon. The end result, as any of the Americans here will know, is that borders went bankrupt. Barnes & Noble, by contrast, put a lot of effort into its Nook e-reader to compete with the Kindle and put a lot of effort also into bn.com, barnesandnoble.com, to try and compete with Amazon. The result, they're still struggling, but they're still alive which is a huge uh, improvement over Borders, who's been gone for probably about a decade now. So just an example of, you know, it's not a question of Barnes & Noble having had a better trend pack uh, or, or hiring better consultants. In the end, it's a question of how you look at it, how you interpret the facts, and this is really critical. The facts themselves are necessary but not sufficient. Now, the bear, point number six. Um, and in this one, it probably doesn't matter for those online if you see a mirror image or not. But um, there was an electric utility 
Uh, I'm from Montreal, where we actually know how to deal with the snow and ice and so on when it comes. And so it's very rare to have a snow day. But in some places in the US, where it only happens once or twice a year, or in London, they are less well equipped to deal with it. And there was a utility in the Pacific Northwest, where it only happened once every year or two, that they had a massive snowstorm followed by rising temperatures such that the uh, there would be snow and ice accumulating on all the power lines, which were still above ground at the time. And this was a big problem because as the temperatures rose, if the lines froze over, then any sort of uh, tree falling or even branch falling would knock them down and it would mess up the whole thing and give power failures to thousands of people. So. The gist of it is that they had this procedure that every time after a big snow or ice storm, people would go in the cherry picking trucks with a long stick and smack the snow and ice off of the wires. This was not a very popular job. Um, nobody really wanted to do it. It was bloody cold and it was dangerous and, and all the rest of it. So they had a, a brainstorm. They had a creativity session. How can we come up with different solutions for this thing? And they came up with nothing. They had no, no, they wallpapered the room with post-its and flip charts, but nothing was usable and practical. And then the next day, um, one of the people who was in this session actually was talking to his friend at the water cooler and said, you know, I remember this time when I was going up there with the stick and then I came down and I was face to face with a big bear. And so I did what I'm supposed to do. I backed away very carefully from the bear. And uh, with a bit of nerves, I, I basically, I made it back to my, to my truck, thankfully. His friend said to him, wouldn't it be great if we could train the bear to climb the pole and knock the, the, the snow and ice off the wires? Then we wouldn't have to do it. And they laughed and said, OK, what a stupid, ridiculous idea. But by the way, if we were going to do that, maybe all we'd need to do is put a pot of honey at the top of the pole so that the bear would climb the pole and knock the snow and ice off the wires. And they laughed and said, OK, it's stupid. I mean, if you put the pot of honey there, I mean, the bear would just go the day before the snowstorm and eat the honey. You'd have to actually go and put the pot of honey there right after the snowstorm. How on earth could we do that? Well, you could do it with a helicopter, but that would also be completely stupid. Um, and then. A third person who was overhearing their conversation said, by the way, the wash from the rotor of the helicopter, if you did that, would actually knock all the snow and ice off the wires without any need for the bear or honey at all. So the point is, um, somebody who knew something about helicopters, somebody who kind of allowed this ridiculous idea to flourish a little bit, um, this, this idea of having the helicopters fly at low altitude just over the uh, the wires after a snowstorm became standard procedure for the last decade or so at this utility. It saves people from doing this thing. It's actually simpler and cheaper in many ways and certainly has no need of the bears. So the point I'm making is this. And this is the classic, uh, the classic guidelines of, of brainstorming. Um, allow the wild ideas to take root because they may eventually lead to something and build on the ideas of others in a yes and way while withholding your judgment. It's very, very easy for us all as, as Western educated logical people to say that's ridiculous, that'll never fly, let's check with the CEO, let's check with legal, um, whatever you want. But at the end of the day, if we allow these ideas to take root, at least while we're in a creative session, and only then challenge them, the results can be very, very powerful and, and fun, like this, like this bear story. Now, point number five. Um, I had a workshop a couple of weeks ago in Spain with the CEO and leadership team of a major fashion retailer. And this is a fashion retailer that has stores all over the world. It ha I shouldn't say retailer, designer, a designer and retailer. Basically, they have stores all over the world, a fashion label. And um, if you ask people, maybe 10 years ago, they would have said, wow, this is avant-garde. This is fantastic. This is trendsetter. It's not, I'm not generally a trendsetter in fashion, so I don't actually know. Um, but um, it, it was a fantastic brand, a fantastic trend-setting brand in fashion. If you ask people today who are in the know, they might say that it's a little bit past its prime, a little bit um, well, a little bit stale, and the brand needs a refresh. And so we had a workshop basically focused on how can we get fresh ideas out there like we used to, like 20 years ago, 
like all of these times, how can we improve the product design process? So it wasn't about coming up with specific fashion ideas. That is not my area. Um, but trying to improve the product design process. And so we sat there. And the CEO, who had founded this label 30 years ago and was the visionary um, name behind all of this fantastic creativity, methodically shut down everything. He basically systematically said, that'll never work. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. We can only go with whites. I don't know, all of this stuff. Um, and it was a little bit shocking, because this was the guy who had actually enabled the brand to become what it was over the years. But he was shooting it down. And obviously, when the CEO founder um, is doing that, it's very, very hard for other people to participate. Um, the point I'm making is, in a creative session, allow yourself to forget about hierarchy at least temporarily. And the onus in this case was probably more on him. And when we had a second session with the same people, we coached him in advance uh, not to do that, and it went much, much better. Uh, but in the end, the idea is we have to forget about hierarchy. We have to forget where ideas come from. Frankly, BCG in general is a very good place for that. Maybe not perfect, but better than many of our clients. And I'm really proud and excited for that. But it's not easy. Because if you go through 99% of your work life saying, all right, this guy's the boss, this guy's the big shot, this woman is really important, and all the rest of it, then suddenly when you're in a creativity session with this person, their ideas seem to carry more weight. Or when they shoot something down, it certainly seems to carry more weight. The more you can allow yourself to forget about hierarchy, at least for a few hours, while you're in this creativity session, the better. Now, in addition, Challenge your perspective. A couple of the exercises that I use most frequently with clients are really, it's, it's not so much about forcing yourself to identify and then challenge your models. Yes, we do that, as I said with the low-cost airline example. But more than that, because we're human, we sometimes need help in being pushed out of our existing ways of thinking. And so instead of walking into the office for a session with in mind, I'm a hotel player, I'm a hotel player, I'm a pen player, I'm a cable manufacturer, I'm whatever I am, um, I ask them often to look at things from completely different perspectives. Imagine we're trying to grow, we're trying to delight our customers, we're trying to cut costs, whatever problem you're trying to solve creatively. How would, instead of five, 15 executives from your company here. Imagine we had five executives from Apple and Amazon and Starbucks and whatever you want. You can choose the companies carefully. But how would they tackle this problem if they were here in our shoes? Well, they might think about changing the whole ecosystem if they were Apple. They might think about having an online marketplace if they were Amazon. They might think about new payment methods if they were Starbucks. They might think about peer-to-peer -peer models if they were Uber, and operational excellence if they were FedEx, and Disney, and whatever else you want. Um, and suddenly, pushing people to take the Disney mindset, to take the FedEx mindset to their own problem can be a fantastic way of pushing people away from their usual ways of thinking. Um, similarly, sometimes we ask them, you know, imagine it's 2020 and you are a 37-year-old consultant or a 63-year-old retired couple in Tokyo or a 21-year-old student or a 45-year-old chef or whatever you want. Um, imagine they are talking excitedly about your brand in 2018. How did we get there? What did we do in 2015 to get them excited in 2018? And it, it opens the door to a lot of new possibilities and ideas as we're going through the process. So in essence, the more you challenge your perspective and put yourself in the shoes of others, the better. Um, number three, more broadly than a specific workshop or ideation session or brainstorm, try and bake this into your life. And that can be a little bit harder. but. Um, I've heard from people who, who really try and act differently. What does it mean? You know, Luc, for example, my, my mentor, reads books all the time, uh, biographies of different geniuses, uh, stories about different people, what's been happening. Other people have been known to take up marathon running or rock climbing or whatever else you want. Not because they're, I mean, for example, one person I knew was super scared of heights. But she deliberately took up marathon running because this idea of challenging her, her fears and challenging perspectives she felt would carry over into her work. And it doesn't mean that rock climbing is the secret to creativity. Let's be clear. But trying to experiment with new habits and try different things. If you're very conservative politically, try reading a liberal newspaper and vice versa. And you won't enjoy it. It'll be very unpleasant. But your perspectives will be challenged. 
in many ways, and, and that's the point. So the more you can experiment with a new habit, a new language, a new biography of, of somebody, a new genre of books, a new type of, of newspaper or magazine, it will push you outside your usual ways of thinking. And that is useful for bringing creativity to your work much more broadly than, than, than any particular three-hour session. Number two, remember that constraints actually foster creativity. You know, people have this attitude and habit of, you know, we need an unconstrained blue sky session, no guardrails, there's no such thing as a bad idea. Um, and this to me is a recipe for wallpapering the room with ideas, sure, but not necessarily useful ones. And in fact, putting some constraints on it, if you say, we need ideas that, that cost less than X, or that can be implemented in less time than Y, or that are safe for children, or that fit with our brand image, or whatever it is, if you set these constraints in place up front, and then ideate, the probability of coming up with useful ideas is much, much higher. By the way, it's harder. It's much harder to come up with ideas when you constrain them in that way, but the probability of finding useful ones is much higher. And if, of course, you want to challenge one of those constraints, well, maybe we don't need all of our things to be safe for children. Maybe we can have a separate line. Or maybe we can have some long-term ideas that take longer than why to implement. That's fine. But to actually deliberately challenge some of these constraints, once you actually know what they are, is fantastically powerful. And you know, some of the examples I put on here are just the idea of, of, of haiku and the, the limits on number of syllables or sonnets. And the same thing in jazz versus symphony. Um, you know, the symphony in many ways was constrained in terms of number of movements, and it led to fantastic creativity. And jazz, which people often think of as completely improvisational, is a beautiful example of being improvisational within very specific rules, very specific boundaries. Um, so all of these things really help foster creativity in my perspective. And then the last, uh, the last point I'll make, and I think then we'll have lots of time for questions, uh, both online and live, um, is be willing to improvise. Um, this is especially relevant, I think, for the BCGers in the room, because um, we have this habit of wanting to be deductive and over-deliver and be analytical and make an agenda that has every 15 minutes outlined of precisely how we're going to spend the day. Ideation exercise number three, number four, number five, convergence, prioritization, operationalization, and all of this stuff, which is great. We should go in with a plan. We should be prepared, by all means, but we should also be willing to change the plan. We should also be willing to improvise. And this is something that's maybe uh, easier for those who are jazz musicians than for symphony musicians, I don't know. But it's tough for those of us in the business world who spend so much of our time in the deductive, logical, analytical mode sometimes. And so to be willing to play it by ear up to a point, to be willing to deviate from the plan and be willing to improvise is, is a fantastic thing. So. Voila, those are the top 10 tips on hashtag how to be creative. Um, I've been rambling for a while with a little bit of interaction on some of the stories, but now would really love to open it up for questions, thoughts, how to bring this to clients, how to bring this to our own lives as consultants. Um, and Rachel can help moderate and find some questions from the online gang as well. So um, we've got this handy dandy microphone here for those of you in the room. Even if you don't think you need it, um, use it anyway so that those online can hear your question. And with that, um, the floor is open for any questions. Anything online? Otherwise, I'll start showing cartoons and we'll be done. We do have one. So online, someone asked, as consultants and as BCGers, what's, what's the box that we should be aware of? What can we break out of? Oh, la, la. What's the box that we should be aware of as consultants and BCGers? Well, you know, I would welcome views from the room on this point. I think part of being human is that we all have hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of boxes in use at any given time. This is what a consultant should do. This is the way we run things around here. This is the way my client operates. This is who our customers are, and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we absolutely cannot challenge all of those boxes at the same time. 
And so it becomes a question, like with this low-cost airline example, of which ones are we reasonably satisfied with at the moment, and which ones are we actually willing to challenge? Which ones are we willing to look at in fresh ways? I don't know if it's a satisfactory answer if other people have other perspectives on what box we as consultants find ourselves in, or a different question from the room. You know, I see a lot of people here that I've worked with on different projects, and so hopefully uh, half of the stories at least are new to you. And then the other people I haven't worked with, they're all probably new, but um, would really welcome any, any thoughts. Please. Yes. So, so how should we approach an ideation session or a brainstorming session in, in our projects? Uh, how did you do it differently than you did before writing this book? Yeah, so I think that I'm going to answer this question by sort of posing a different one um, and answering that as well. Because sometimes when I, when I go and give a speech outside, outside BCG, people will say, you know, why don't you start your own ideation shop? Why are you still within this big firm that, that is so left-brained and that is so focused on operationalization and all the rest? And my answer is actually, apart from some of what was said this morning about strategy and providing a home and, and family uh, within here, but my real answer is that so many brainstorms, you have a productive day, a fun day, you wallpaper the room with ideas, and then the creativity facilitator leaves and they're stuck and they don't get things done. And the beauty of being part of this big family, of being part of BCG, is that I have colleagues who when they call me from Copenhagen or Santiago and say, can you help with this creativity thing? And I help by phone or I help live or by video, whatever it is. Um, after that, they will still get it done. They will still tie it to strategy afterwards. They will still link it up with making the ideas happen and turning it into a coherent, strategy. And so the reason this gets at your question is because to me as a BCGer, helping prepare an ideation session, it really has to fit neatly within a two month, a four month, a, a, a two week, I don't care, but within a broader project, within a broader client relationship. What are we really trying to achieve? If it's growth, if it's cost cutting, if it's creativity and org design, I don't care what. But whatever it is, let's have a very clear question. Let's use some of the techniques that we've tried. And then, even if I disappear, I can be, uh, I can sleep at night knowing that the ideas will actually be shepherded through to, to their completion. And, and that, to me, is really exciting and part of running creativity within the context of a place like BCG. And so to answer how to do it, I mean, that's, that's what it is. Let's, let's find ways to bring these principles to almost any case, because what BCG has really been about for 51 years is changing perspectives and getting people to look at the situation differently. Other questions? Please. Um, this is the wrong one. This is the right one. But it's off again. Steve. Yes, from so um, thinking in new boxes and evaluating those ideas in new boxes, are they the same thing, or is that like the, the next requirements that you need once you have allowed people to be creative and come up with a bunch of ideas you know if you evaluate those ideas with the same with the old mindset some of these great ideas may may not flourish so i was wondering if there is a chapter two um, how to evaluate ideas in different boxes quite right steve and it's um it's actually chapter six in the book. Um, but um, the, the, the point you're making is very valid, that there's a natural tendency, you know, if you, you start at 9 a.m. and by 2.30 p.m. you've spent, the, you've wallpapered the whole room with possibilities, and then, okay, now we're gonna shift our mindset from divergence to convergence and prioritization. And there's a very natural tendency of human beings to simply weed out all of the wild and crazy stuff and focus on the things that are very close to what we've done, the incremental, the inside the box, whatever you want to call them, ideas. Um, the best way to overcome this that I can think of is, is, well, there's a couple of techniques I try. One of them is to be very specific and clear on the criteria in advance before you start brainstorming rather than uh, making it up as you go along afterward because people even subconsciously will have a tendency to adapt the criteria to the ideas they already have in mind if you wait too late. But more than that, um, if our goal at 2.30 on this day is to just do a very quick high-level convergence 
and just get a sense, a pulse check of those in the room uh, of which ideas that we've just generated have potential. Uh, one thing I often do is I give people stickers. Um, let's say three green stickers and three blue stickers. The color doesn't matter. Even the number three doesn't matter. It can be four or two or anything. But the point is, ask them to choose the top three ideas that you think are, are things we should pursue because of cost benefit and feasibility and time to implementation and fit with our brand and whatever else you want. And those will be the ones that kind of may be more incremental. I don't know, but, but three. And then with another color sticker, let them choose the top three ideas that maybe they're less fully fleshed out but they believe there's really the spark of something big there. And if they had 10% of their time free, like Google used to have um, for passion projects, they would really love to pursue this in their spare time, in their magic time. This is really something that could be the next big thing. And, and it invites people to take a bit of a risk in the convergence process. And if you force people to make all their choices before you give out the stickers in order to avoid groupthink, um, and then actually let people put their stickers all over the place, sometimes you see a little bit of clustering among the different colors. And it gives you a bit of a portfolio between short-term, long-term, uh, big, uh, outside the box, and inside the box, whatever words you want to use. But it gives you a bit of a portfolio, which in the end is what you're after. A, a little bit of the out there and a little bit of the incremental as well is usually uh, what makes sense. Great. I give the microphone back to Rachel. So this one from online. In your view, is there a difference between ideating alone versus ideating with a group from a process and approach perspective? And then how can one be more successful when ideating alone? Absolutely, there's a difference. Um, it was uh, you know, one of the philosophers that Luke taught me about um, was Immanuel Kant, who basically said, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. So we each see the world from our own perspective, and that's why when one is having an ideation session with a group, the better to have different perspectives, younger, older, uh, more senior, less senior, men, women, different academic backgrounds, different work experience, whatever you want, as many dimensions of diversity, fantastic. So bringing all that to the table, you know, obviously provides a big benefit compared with doing it alone. But when one is doing it alone, there can be fantastic merit. And this is, uh, this is also something I learned from someone at the back of the room, James. Um, there can be fantastic merit in simply forgetting about the full inbox and the full calendar, closing the computer, and taking a white piece of paper and just trying to think, what are the boxes? What are the assumptions that I'm making, the hidden ones? What are the constraints that are binding me when I think about this problem? What are the boxes I'm in? Um, what are the ways I'm thinking about this? And if you can think again about which of those might be ready for a challenge, then you've already made some progress alone. It's not the same sort of thing as a group ideation session, but it can still be extremely powerful. So maybe that helps. Yes. I feel I have to pass it to James then, uh, but um, can you pass it back? Thank you. Yeah, just for the online folks. I can repeat it if I have to, so it doesn't matter. And I was going to ask you how, for me, one of the things you need for creativity is time, right? So if, it, if, you do, if I think of your bear story, part of that is entertaining the ideas, but part of it is having the time to entertain the ideas. So right. if, we, if we shift into you know, the, all the time compression, et cetera, that becomes hard. If I think of some of the clients that I work with, you know, most of them would find it really hard to create a half day or the by the 2.30 we've got the wall. They're actually in much more, you know, hour, two hours. Or something. Any suggestions on, you know, how to get them to addicted to it? So, you know, the shorter, you know, what's the shorter version or the time compressed version that gets them to see through the value that then may lead them into the mm. nirvana? A great question, yes. Um, so first of all, Yes, it resonates, and I'm sure with, with many of the others, you know, we're all swamped with stuff. Um, and as I've said already, I think even taking 10 minutes rather than a full day session with a white sheet of paper and thinking about your boxes, it's already a good start. But how does one get addicted to that? How does it become a habit? And I think that along with, with, with some other habits can be really useful. You know, the idea of, 
you know, uh, whenever there's somebody I know who, whenever they make an important uh, PowerPoint presentation, they make three versions of the executive summary. Uh, one is the version that they would explain to an eight-year-old child. One is the version they'd explain to the CEO. And whatever you want, imposing constraints like this, trying to um, trying to not use the letter S in your executive, whatever it is, but it pushes you to look for new words. It pushes you to be creative. And so I think some of the habits are are some of these things I was saying when it's about acting differently, trying new new genres of literature, trying new, just getting into this spirit of being willing to challenge assumptions. Um, these are the best sort of tips I have for baking it into one's life. But how to do so, frankly, um, is tough. It, it's a question of getting started and, and then sticking with it in some way. And the best way I know to do that, you know, sometimes at the end of a training or something, an enablement type of session, I'll, I'll have them fill in some template, you know, what are the two, three things I've taken away and what are the two things I'm going to do differently next week, however you want to phrase it. But to actually get people started in some of these habits is, is the best suggestion I have because once you do and you see the power of it, um, hopefully you get addicted. Um, look, I see that we're basically at time, though we started a couple minutes late. So I'll end with, with two cartoons, which some of you may have seen before in the room. But to me, they're very powerful. Um, you know, number one from The New Yorker is this thing stressing the importance of taking the time to stop and think. As I said, closing the laptop and just thinking, what are my existing boxes? How do I look at the world? But at the same time, as James got at very eloquently, recognizing since we're in Paris and the Rodin thinker here, that we are not in an uh, ivory tower where we have the luxury of only thinking. We have to balance this thinking and doing. And you could also call that exploring and exploiting, as was seen in the ambidexterity stuff this morning. You could also call that right brain and left brain, or thinking and doing, or you can call it this um, deductive and inductive analytics and creativity, whatever it is. But to me, the essence of a company that's going to be successful is one that can balance this in the right measure. And the essence of a person that's going to be successful at this, recognizing that some of us are much more inclined here or much more inclined there, is to also try and find the right level of balance between thinking and doing, exploring and exploiting. And, and so when it comes to how to be creative, um, these are some of the tips that I thought might help. So let me, let me just end especially for those online, but for anyone in the room as well, if you want to tweet how to by BCG or hashtag new boxes or anything else, if you're into that sort of thing, by all means do. But um, almost more importantly, for those of you in the room, um, if there are any suggestions or advice I can offer for casework with clients, um, I think I've, I've touched a couple of hundred cases or proposals so far this year, as I said, in 18 countries and all the rest. And it's an amazing luxury and pleasure to be able to do that. 85% um, of the time remotely and sometimes by getting on a plane. So um, I love what I do. I love the idea of spreading the gospel of creativity within BCG. And if there's any way that can be useful with your clients or for those online, um, you know where to find me.